Tago, which means it's Vamos time. Um, it's really my pleasure to introduce this week's speaker, uh, Professor Benjamin Lev uh, from Stanford University. As you can uh, probably tell from his sunny demeanor and obvious brilliance, Ben uh, was a Princeton undergrad. Um, he then went on to Caltech, conducting his doctoral work in the group of Hibideo Mabuchi uh, on magnetic microtraps micro for quantum science uh, and his postdoctoral work uh, at Jilla uh, in the group of Junyi working on uh, cooling and trapping of OH molecules. Uh, from there, he took a faculty position at UIUC before moving to Stanford uh, in 2011. Uh, the way I would tell uh, the story of Ben's science, uh, if I were asked to, and I suppose I have been asked to, uh, is to say that he takes uh, very much a science first rather than techniques first uh, approach to, uh, to asking questions. Uh, for example, many of his group's experimental efforts center on the goal of exploring condensed matter models with ranged as opposed to contact interactions. Uh, and he has really sort of kickstarted the community in these directions. Uh, his proposals to explore many body physics of long range interacting glassy matter with uh, atoms and multimode resonators uh, has actually inspired many of my own group's directions. Uh, and his group's demonstration of Bose and Fermi degeneracy of dysprosium, uh, the most magnetic atom, have inspired uh, experiments all around the world. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'll hand it off to Ben. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, John, for that nice introduction. And thanks, everybody out there for, for listening. And it's a pleasure and an honor to, to be able to speak to you at this uh, Vamos seminar series. So today, I'd like to tell you about one of the experiments that we have recently performed, where we have created a strange sort of Archimedes screw with dipolar one-dimensional gases. So the star of the show is dysprosium. And here's an image of a dysprosium beam coming out of a very hot oven. And we've used this highly magnetic atom to realize a novel sort of topological pumping scheme that allows us to create strongly correlated pre-thermal states. And I'll tell you what all that means. But the people who've uh, done all the work that I want to introduce are pictured here. Uh, the senior student is Will Cal. He just defended his PhD thesis and Kuan Yu Li here. And younger students are Kuan Yu Lin and Kang Ming Yang. And they've done a tremendous job uh, doing this uh, work. We also have the pleasure of uh, working with theorist Saran Gopal Krishnan, who's now at Penn State. Okay, without further ado, let me jump into the talk. So I'd like to begin with um, you know, a few words about the relationship between integrability, chaos, and thermalization. So what is integrability? Well, it's regular motion, such as you see in a ball in a circular uh, stadium, circular boundary conditions, or if you launch it, it will undergo some regular pattern of oscillating motion. So integrability, is the proper property of such a system in which you have an extensive number of conserved quantities so you can integrate the equations of motion out to whatever time you like to predict what will happen. So an example of this that you might have played with is the Newton's cradle. It's a toy that you can put on your desk and you can set it in motion and it'll oscillate back and forth, but you know, of course, eventually it will equilibrate or thermalize or uh, or deaden its motion um, through friction, but in an ideal world, the ideal Newton's cradle would just cycle over and over and over again. Now this is in contrast to cha chaotic motion. So one way to uh, generate chaotic motion is to warp the boundary condition of the circular billiard into an elliptical billiard. And then you see that trajectories of particles have this spaghetti-like pattern. You can call it a pattern at all. It's not really, it's random. Um, in the sense that uh, at lot late, late times, the trajectory is exponentially sensitive to the initial condition. So it's very, 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 very hard and in principle, not really possible to predict the long time uh, trajectory. So that's one way in which chaos can emerge from regular motion. Another way is through uh, a change in dimensionality. So in one dimension, we know that collisions conserve both total and individual momenta. So if we have two particles colliding on the line, there's no way they can go around each other. The only thing they can do is reverse. And so the momentum just gets mapped on to the negative of the momentum. So that does not change 
any momentum distribution at all, okay? And so that is more like this kind of motion, it's integrable. However, in three dimensions, in two dimensions, because particles can have glancing collisions and can go off in all sorts of angles, then just after a few such collisions, um, the momentum distribution at the initial state is randomized into a Gaussian distribution or a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So that is what we mean by equilibration or thermalization of these kinds of systems is that you have a Gaussian-like distribution of momenta uh, a long time. So more generally, we know from the KAM theorem that chaos emerges smoothly in systems when you introduce a nonlinearity, say, to the Hamiltonian. So uh, we can picture this by looking at a phase space portrait where here I've plotted a momentum and position. Well, I didn't plot it, it's from this nice paper. Um, and you see that the, tra the trajectories are very regular. It could be from a particle like this where they have closed loops and there's nothing random or chaotic about this. But if we increase some chaotic perturbation and nonlinearity, what generically happens is that um, the regular motion gets isolated into little islands and uh, between them you percolate these regions of chaos which is, looks like this noisy little pattern here and as you increase the strength eventually these islands shrink to nothing and the whole system becomes chaotic all right and so that is kind of what's hap what happens when you know, in the morning you pour your milk inside your coffee and you see these beautiful swirls that's turbulence, but turbulence is a manifestation of chaos. And this quickly equilibrates into the nice brown muck that you crave in the morning, or maybe you're, you're craving it right now, depending on your time zone. Um, and, uh, and it's ir irreversible. And what, what this really highlights is the fact that chaos and the fact that it allows you to um, ergodically explore all the phase space is what underpins what we consider, you know, what we would conceive of as thermalization and equilibration. So that's the connection be, behind these terms. So in the quantum world, this is all becomes a lot more confusing. You can't even write down trajectories really in a closed isolated system. So there's an outstanding question, which is, you know, how near integrable quantum many body systems thermalize? It's an unclear thing. And uh, it behooves us to create experiments that can investigate it to build our intuition such that we can feed back to, to theorists and build up a nice framework like the KM theorem in classical physics. Okay, so one thing that we can do uh, in order to generate a chaotic system controllably from an integrable system is to introduce long range forces. That is one known way in order to make a system that's integral and periodic and turn it into something that is chaotic. And so, in fact, you can make, you can go on YouTube and you can look at uh, magnetic Newton's cradles. They're really fun to watch. Um, and you can see that the motion is, is qualitatively very different. And, uh, you know, you can convince yourself that it's, it's chaotic motion like, like this, okay? So what is wanted is to find a quantum many body uh, integrable system like this that we can then perturb with so, somehow long range forces is a good way so that we can explore this physics, okay? So uh, at this point, I will ask and see if there's any questions. Shimon, or I don't know who's handling it, no? Okay, well, you Sorry, can jump I'm, 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 I am, I just was having trouble finding the unmute button, I apologize. So um, Maybe this is a question of interpretation, but we sort of have a, a couple of questions here. One is, uh, uh, are all closed quantum systems integrable since time evolution is unitary? Aren't they reversible? Uh, no, they're not. And this is what's really interesting. And it's been something very exciting since uh, at least the early 90s. Um, there's this thing called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which says that if you have a, a Hamiltonian with some... Uh, terms in it that don't commute or do things that break integrability formally, then expectation, local expectation values are equivalent to uh, what you would expect from a thermal ensemble. So these things look like they're chaotic with respect to those uh, observables. That's the subject of another really neat talk and probably people in the audience are more expert in this. Um, so, so can yeah. I interpret this as saying somehow from the perspective of any given particle, the system looks non-integrable, but if, yeah, I mean, there are Hamiltonians that for a closed system that are not integrable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's, uh, that's, yeah. 
That's a first question. Uh, the second one is uh, quantum system have a version of uh, non chaotic islands uh, like scars. Uh, is there a quantum analog of a mostly integral system with? Uh, uh, wow, with that's a great islands? question. And that's what my talk is about. <laughs> Perfect question. Um, OK, so here's another, uh, I think, really great question, maybe even better than the last one. Uh, Dan Stamperkern asks, uh, what was the name of your band in college? I am not telling you, Dan. Maybe on a bike ride, I'll tell you. Okay. Um, and uh, and, and uh, Norm Yao asks, uh, beyond free th theories like uh, free fermions, uh, which can be integrable, integrable in any dimension, are there any non-trivial uh, examples of integrability in D larger than one? Oh, I don't know. Um, mm, I don't know. I actually don't know. I have a book that lists all the known integrable models. I'm sure we can look at that after, afterwards in the uh, discussion section. Why don't we do that? Okay, but not not off the top of my head. Thank you. So you can. Okay. Ahead. All right. Let's go. Okay. So uh, so what we want is a quantum version of the Newton's cradle, and uh, thankfully uh, David Weiss, uh, 15, 14 years ago or so. Um, had in, uh, performed a very inspired experiment where he created a quantum version of the Newton's cradle using a one dimensional quantum gas of rubidium. And that really set forth a lot of interesting discussions and really motivated the work that we're doing today. So what he did was to create a 2D optical lattice. So retroreflected two pairs of beams in the Z and Y directions, which in the X direction, if you look end on, um, looks like these little tubes, these little cigar shaped traps made out of light. And there's, you know, maybe hundreds of these. And each one of these is a Newton's cradle, okay? And you can simultaneously kick them all uh, and in such a way as to create two momentum packets that move in opposite directions. And as they move up the potential barrier uh, to the left and to the right, they stop and then come back down and then they collide. And so there's two collisions per period. And by dropping the gas and letting it expand for a while, you can take an absorption image that, is, uh, that records the momentum distribution of the atoms. And this is an example from their paper where they uh, look at uh, stroboscopically through one period. And you can see two collisions right here and right here where the atoms collide. Now, of course, they're atoms and so they can pass through each other quantum mechanically. And so that's very different than the classical version which are made out of metal balls. Um, uh, but that's, that's one of the, uh, you know, but otherwise it's a very similar notion, okay? And so if you look at the momentum distribution uh, uh, over time for different periods, you see that the two peaks initially uh, kind of dephase into a flat top distribution, but unlike in, in three dimensions, and I'll show you some data from our experiment on that soon, this flat distribution doesn't immediately become a, a Gaussian. And so the takeaway message from this uh, wonderful experiment was that it demonstrated near integrability. And I think that addresses some of these, these earlier questions. And that, um, you know, eventually, of course, it became a Gaussian because it is, you know, connected to the environment passive, passively, you know, it's, it's not perfectly isolated, um, but it lasts out of a, uh, a Gaussian state for a long time, okay? And that was really fascinating. So what we did recently is replace rubidium with the most magnetic element, dysprosium, which is 10 bore magnetons, 10 times more magnetic than rubidium. It's a, one of these rare earth or lanthanide atoms down here. And we use that to create a magnetic Newton's cradle, but one that's tunable because we can tune the dipole uh, strength, dipole-dipole interaction strength. This is what the experiment looks in my laboratory. It has a lot of beautiful lasers. Um, and as John mentioned, yes, we use this apparatus to create the first quantum gases on this atom, uh, a BC and a degenerate Fermi gas. So we'll use the dysprosium BC to make the magnetic quantum Newton's cradle. But before doing so, let me just show what happens in three dimensions. We just kick, you know, brag diffract this into two peaks. That's how we set it in motion. We see that within hundred milliseconds, the distribution equilibrates to a Gaussian. By contrast, when we put the atoms into the lattice to create this kind of Newton's cradle that's magnetic, that's our, our fancy blender cartoon of it, um, what we see is something very different. We see that instead of just 100 milliseconds, we see that the Gaussian distribution does not arise for two and a half seconds. 
So that's kind of really exciting. You know, that's a macroscopic time scale. Like I can count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and boom, there. Only then does it uh, form a classical distribution. Um, and so that's neat. This is a quantum many body system that, that takes a very long time to thermalize. So uh, what we did in this paper that reported these results is to change the angle of these dipoles in order to change the rate in which this thermalized and try to understand that. And we did, and it's a really neat story. And I, I recommend you look at this paper if you wanna understand the thermalization rate. However, right now I want to focus on these states in particular. These states, which uh, occur after it's uh, dephased and form this flat top distribution, are uh, what are called prethermal states. They, uh, they thermalize at a slow rate, an anonymously slow rate. And that the reason is, is because they possess many, but not all constants of motion. Okay, so they're not, uh, you know, this is not a completely integrable uh, state, it's a near integrable state. So it's somewhere in between. So you can see the slow evolution by plotting the distance to a Gaussian, which we uh, just form a metric of like, say, fitting a Gaussian to this distribution and looking at the residuals and plotting it on the uh, y-axis here and doing that for each time slice. And what you see is this fast dephasing. And then you see this very slow, slow thermalization to the Gaussian state. And this is the region where you have the prethermal states, uh, which I'm going to talk about a lot more in this talk. So of course, we're not the first to observe prethermal states, although this is the system that did us in a strongly uh, correlated system. In a weakly interacting system, York Schmiedmeier also saw similar effects in one dimensional gases from atom chips. And they've, they've been seen in, in, uh, in spin systems and lattices and other contexts. So the point of my talk really is to, um, to show you um, the, a new method for creating prethermal states and in fact, a method that doesn't just create them by whacking the system like a Newton's cradle, which is kind of a violent system. You know, you just hit it really hard and it creates these out of equilibrium momentum distributions. Here, we're gonna be much more delicate about it. We're gonna carefully craft um, prethermal states uh, with complex correlations. And the reason we can do that, um, there's two reasons we can do that. One is that we pump the system. We don't just hit it with a hammer, <laughs> so, so to speak like with the Newton's cradle, we carefully pump it up using a topological method that works not in space, but in energy. It's kind of the energy space and analog of this Archimedes screw. And second, we can keep it stable as we're doing that because of the dipolar interactions. And that's a, a complete surprise. Okay, so that wasn't predicted at all. All right, so let me jump into the uh, nitty gritty details and present our experimental system. So again, we make arrays of one dimensional tubes of light, um, about a thousand of them are, are filled. Um, in each one, we have about 20 atoms uh, that are now magnetic. Um, the aspect ratio is, is very elongated. It's about a thousand to one. The transverse oscillation frequency is about 25 kilohertz. And so at that scale, the temperature is, is quite low. So you don't have accidental real excitations of the transverse momentum or transverse uh, uh, motional states, it's really kind of a, a quenched one dimensional system. Um, now uh, we can take these dipoles and align them with respect to an external magnetic field that's created by two electromagnets, one along the X axis and one along the Z axis, whose ratio of currents can be controlled to angle the dipoles however we like with respect to the X axis, which points along the tubes. And in the Y axis, we take pictures of the momentum distribution. So uh, the controllability comes from the fact that along this line defined by the tube, the long range interaction that scales as one over R cubed uh, also has an anisotropic uh, component to it, which is proportional to one minus three cosine squared theta. So we'll focus on three different um, settings for theta. There's zero degrees, this thing is attractive, okay? Um, so that's, that's head to tail, and if you think about bar magnets. Um, at 90 degrees, it's repulsive, it's side by side. But at 55 degrees, somewhere in the middle, there is no dipolar interaction along the tube. And so these are the special points that we want to focus on. And I know, because it might be interesting later on, that the repulsive strength is half that of the attractive strength when they're saturated at zero or 90 degrees due to this functional form. 
Okay, so what is the, the, the effective model describing the system? Well, for a Bo 1D Bose gas, it's known to be, model, be able to be modeled by the lieb linegar uh, model from the 1960s. And this is an integrable model where um, there's a first term, which is a kinetic energy term, and then an interaction term, which is a hard, wall, hard sphere kind of uh, contact interaction proportional to a delta function whose strength is given by what's called G1D. And you can think about G1D as being proportional from an atomic physics perspective to the three-dimensional scattering length, A3D. And then if you square that, um, this gives you the, the cross-section or the probability for, for colliding. So that gives you a nice picture for what G1D means physically. In order to kind of have a picture for what uh, uh, regimes of states this, uh, this uh, is in the eigenstate spectrum of this, you can take the ratio of the uh, interaction to the kinetic energy, which is given by this, uh, proportional one over the density, and that's called the lieb linegar parameter or gamma. Now, when gamma is much less than one, which corresponds to a small con contact interaction, G1D is small, then you have a Thomas Fermi gas, so, or a quasi uh, BC. So the, the particles wave functions are broad and they overlap, no problem. This is something that's a, we understand from a weakly interacting picture. But then something really interesting happens when you go to the strong coupling regime, the strong interaction regime, where this is greater than one, you get what's known as a tonk jodo or TG gas. And here, the, the, because the energy, interaction energy is so strong, the wave functions don't want to overlap. There's a node between each pair of wave functions. Um, and this is the only thing that can happen because there's a traffic jam in one dimension. The atoms don't want to collide, but they can't move around each other. So you just get this string, okay? And that looks very similar to an ideal Fermi gas, a non-interacting Fermi gas. And that's what's known as Fermionization. And indeed the, the two particle wave function looks like, a, you know, for bosons is like the absolute value of the fermions. So for bosons, you get a node where you know, and in the fermions, you get a node where the particles can't overlap. This node occurs because of poly exclusion, this because of strong interactions. And this, uh, you can see this duality of the, of the field theory associated with this Hamiltonian, because this is infinitely strong interacting. And this is, and this models a system that of no interactions, but Fermi statistics and it's related by the absolute value. That's a very uh, curious thing about the quantum physics in one dimension. Okay, so if you do this sort of system with atoms, uh, you, have the, you, you can use the fact that atoms have resonances that allow you to tune the contact interactions quite dramatically. So there are things called Feshbach resonances, uh, which are collisional resonances um, that allow you to tune uh, interactions. And we have many of them in these lanthanide uh, rare earth atoms. But in particular, we have two very broad ones, well, very, in, in our, with our perspective is not very large, but um, reasonably large ones around 27 gauss in uh, this particular isotope. And they provide access to what are called confinement-induced resonances or CIRs. So you might ask, what is a CIR? Well, CIR is, um, is, is a uh, resonance pole that is modified by confinement. And it usually occurs in, in one dimensional systems near a Feshbach resonance because that's what allows you to tune into it. So in your mind, if you're familiar with Feshbach resonances, just think of the CIR as one of those, but it's actually subtly different and you can read about it here. So with that tunability, what you can do is change the magnetic field. And as you change the magnetic field, you come into resonance, which then allows you to take some background value of G1D um, to go from something small to moderate to divergent and positive in the repulsive regime, crossover just with a small change of the magnetic field into divergent attractive uh, interaction, and then back towards zero and then to the background scattering value here, okay? So that's quite nice. Now we have two of these. We have many of these actually, but two that we are highlighting in this work, and you can just keep doing this, okay? So you can just go right back and do it again. And this is, shows the relative widths of the two ones that we use in our experiment, okay? So what you're actually doing by doing this is tuning cyclically this, this parameter of the Hamiltonian, okay? So you're taking G1D, which is a function of B and going from zero to positive infinity. You hit the pole of the CIR, you go to negative infinity and then back to zero and you can do this again. And this cycle mathematically realizes what's called a quantum holonomy. And so 
you know, classical holonomies exist, uh, you know, quite naturally in many contexts. In fact, in parallel transport of, of an arrow on a surface of a sphere, you can see that you don't get the same um, angle of the arrow when you come back and make a closed group. And that's because of the holonomy of this particular um, topology. So uh, geometry here. Um, and so here we have a quantum version. It's a parameter of a Hamiltonian that you take the Hamiltonian back to the same place, but you don't actually get the same eigenstate when you do that. And so this is a strange sort of quench. It's an adiabatic excitation in the sense that, you know, the wave function from here into here is identical as you go from plus infinity to minus infinity. There's no discontinuity there but it's still a quench because the effect of Hamiltonian has a discontinuity. So it's something like an adiabatic excitation. I know those words seem to not uh, 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 kind of lie together usually, but this is a weird system. And this was pointed out um, a, a few years ago in this paper in PRA by the Japanese group. Okay, so uh, let me back up and explain. Okay, so that's a, that's a topological property and we can exploit it for a topological pumping. So, um, the traditional view of topological pumping is in space. And by tradition, I mean, you know, a millennia of traditions, many millennia. Um, in the, in which is now called the Archimedes screw, you can think about something that has a topological property, uh, you know, a, a chiral piece of metal in a tube. And if you rotate that uh, tube back onto itself, you translate um, something within it maybe it's a ball, maybe it's water, you can translate it up against gravity, okay? You can do work on it. So that's a translation in space. Um, Thales, uh came up with a quantum pump where you can transport charge from lattice site to lattice site uh, through a cyclic evolution of the, the Hamiltonian. And this was demonstrated in many, many contexts, but in the AMO world, this has been demonstrated by Takahashi and Emmanuel Bloch, um, where atoms in a super lattice can move from site to site again by uh, changing a parameter cyclically, okay? So uh, what we're doing is, is subtly different. It's the topological pump and energy eigenstates, okay? So to illustrate that, uh, let, me, uh, let me use a toy version of the lieb Linegar model, which has a kinetic energy term, but the interaction term is a particle in a box with a delta function at the middle with a strength controlled by C, okay? So again, we can change C through the same kind of cycle. And what we can do while we're, as we do that, is examine uh, some wave functions of the system and see how they change. So let's concentrate on the ground state and the first excited state, psi, psi naught and psi one, uh, orange and green. And psi naught here is plotted just a little bit after zero. So you can see a little bit of a dimple because of the, the repulsive delta function at uh, halfway through. That's this dashed line here. And as we increase the uh, strength of that, say, to infinity, the delta function to infinity, we naturally develop a node in the wave functions because of course the particle can't exist there. And we see that this ground state wave function looks like the tung Giordeaux gas wave function that I, I showed you earlier. It has a, a node right, right in the middle right there, okay? All right, so that's pretty straightforward. Now something weird happens as you go from plus infinity to minus infinity. When you do that, you undergo this strange quench that I was telling you about that where the um, eigenstates are continuous. There's no change really in the eigenstate. If you look at the orange one, you see it's the same shape. Uh, and also the green one the is the same one, but they're no longer the, the, the ground in the first excited state. They're now the first excited state and the second excited state because a new bound state, a new ground state has emerged. And that's this red line here. And that's natural because you have an attractive potential and now you have an infinitely attractive potential in one dimension. So you know you have at least one bound state and that's this red uh, wave function here. And by coming in there, you've kind of adiabatically excited this state, psi zero to psi one. Okay, so that's what we mean here. Now, if we go, um, if we decrease the attractive uh, interaction a little bit, uh, or sorry, potential a little bit, then what happens is something really neat. What you get is something where the tung Giordeaux gas wave function starts to dip down even more and you develop two little nodes, two, two little nodes here, okay? And that it kind of more or less excludes some of the volume here, at least in a classical picture where you have hard rods, okay? So this kind of can map onto a classical hard rod in a box picture 
where the spacing between these nodes is given by a length A1D, which in the classical picture is the length of the rods, okay? This is known as a super Tonks-Giraudot gas. Super because um, it's stiffer because it has more correlations. There's more zeros in the wave functions and has some of this exclusion volume. And this is a really interesting excited state of strongly correlated quantum matter. Now, as you go back to zero again, what you see is that you have now pumped the first uh, excited, the, the ground state wave function to the first excited wave function and all others from psi i to psi i plus one. And you can see that psi one here now is the, uh, is the inverse of psi one over here. And that's just a pattern of this particular model that you just get this alternation as you pump up and up. And psi one here is now psi two, it's the second excited state. So this is topological pumping and energy eigenstates. Okay, and now I'll, I'll take a pause and ask for, for more questions. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions here. Okay. Um, so um, first, Christy Chu asks, uh, what makes a quantum Newton's cradle quantum? Uh, so maybe one way to rephrase this, is there a clear way to distinguish the dynamics uh, from one might, what one might observe for uh, classical interacting point particles? Um, well, let's see, I can answer that in two ways. One way is that, you know, uh, the atoms can pass through one another, okay? Whereas, you know, classical balls will not do that. That's maybe a kind of a trivial version of why it's quantum. Um, if you were to kick it gently, um, the states that you, the momentum distributions that you create might have it, correlations that are non-classical. Unfortunately, the way that we've kicked it and David Weiss have kicked it, it's a little bit violent. And so the energy density at the end when it, it, it equilibrates is really kind of a thermal gas by that point, though in the middle and the transition in the middle, there could be, uh, you know, interesting quantum correlations. Um, the second thing is that the interactions when you have gamma around one or a few, this is really going through uh, kind of a, you know, an interesting regime of the lieb linegar model that has no uh, direct classical correspondence. Okay, good question, thank you. Um, we have another one. Um, if you go adiabatically forward in the holonomic loop and then adiabatically backward, do you uh -huh. end up in the same initial state? Can, can you actually do that? Is, is it um, yes, and we did do that, um, just to see what would happen. Uh, and uh, I have some data at the end, not part of the deck, but uh, at the end of the deck um, that I can show you the data, but the, the uh, answer is that it collapses, okay? Once you go a little bit too, if you go backwards to here, just like in two and three dimensions where you have Bose Novas, we also have a 1D Bose Nova and the thing collapses into cluster states. And I can explain later why. So I have one more question here. Um, it seems like you have a, you have a, a a holonomy in a single parameter of a many body system, right? Uh -huh. So if, if you have two parameters and you have some discrete jump in the holonomy, then that's like having anions in your system, right? So is, is there some I'll kind I'll take of, your word for it. I'm not sure actually. I, I just mean like if you, if you have a two parameter system and you can uh -huh. move yourself through the parameter space in some kind uh -huh. of a non-trivial way and pick up a gauge field in some many body degree of freedom. So is there, is there a connection? Uh, um, and you don't mean you know, like a connection in the top topological sense? Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how to realize. <laughs> yes, thank you, Ben. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, that's an interesting question. I don't know how I'd realize that, but it's a neat thing to think about, especially since I do have two parameters. I have the magnetic interaction and the contact. So, Ah, I see. So you could, but, you could tune the other one. But only one of them I, I do know relates to a topological uh, in, in, invariant, but uh, okay. Maybe we can speculate about that later. Yeah, so, so maybe I'll, uh, we'll let you uh, move, move forward and uh, we okay. can speculate about it. Okay, cool, thanks, neat questions. All right, so this is topological pumping in energy eigenstates. Um, let's, let's see if we can do it. So first we have to back up and see if we can uh, fingerprint any of these states. So you know, you're changing this parameter through a magnetic field. How do you know that you've gone from a Thomas Fermi gas to a Tonks Giraudot to a Super Tonks, right? Well, uh, we know because Christoph Negrel and his group showed us how to do that. They showed us how to identify the state via measuring stiffness or what we call R, which is the inverse compressibility of the gas. Okay, so the way to do that 
is to measure the ratio of collective oscillation frequencies. So if you take the dipole frequency, which is just sloshing back and forth, and, uh, and, and uh, compare that to the breathing mode, which is like the first collective oscillation, then you can isolate the interactions because the dipole frequency depends on the trap alone, whereas the breathing mode depends both on the trap and on the interactions. And so you can imagine if you divide this by this, you, you kind of isolate the contribution from the interactions to the stiffness. And that's exactly what this parameter R is. It's the uh, ratio of that squared for convenience. And, um, and that allows you to kind of fingerprint the four different regimes we'll talk about. So um, there is the ideal gas, Bo ideal Bose gas regime, which has a stiffness of four in this, in the, in this ratio. Um, and that's similar to a thermal gas. And that's just you know, kind of indicative of the fact that there's few correlations in that kind of system. Then there's the uh, intermediate interacting system, which is less stiff, okay? Uh, the, the wave functions are kind of overlap, it's a little floppy. That's the weakly interacting Bose gas, the Thomas Fermi quasi BZ. And then it becomes stiff again because, you know, the Tang Zhirou regime, even though it's infinitely strong interacting, it's mappable onto an ideal Fermi gas now. And so then it again looks like R equals four. And then when you do this uh, gentle quench, you go into the super tonsured gas regime and it becomes more stiff with a, an R greater than four because you have these exclusion zones. You have more correlations in the system. So let me uh, show you Christoph Nagel's data for uh, cesium, which is weakly dipolar. But before I do that, let me explain how that is uh, most easily plotted. So on the y-axis, you have R, okay? That's just given in these units here. And then on the, the x-axis, you have a strange quantity called A squared. A squared just naturally pops out of a local density approximation that accounts for you know, changing the numbers of, of atoms in the tube or changing the lengths of the tube. So you can compare all those together. And it's proportional to the square of the inverse of the uh, contact interaction strength or this A1D parameter squared, okay? Now, another confusing thing is that on the left-hand side over here, you have the infinitely strong interacting system, either positive or negative, Whereas on the right-hand side, you have a, a weakly or, or non-interacting gas, okay? So it's a little bit backwards from your intuition. Okay, so here's part of their data. So they start out here in the Thomas Fermi mean field regime of uh, weakly interacting BC. And, and lo and behold, they do see that R is equal to three, close to three. And then as they change the, their magnetic field through their CIR that they use, it becomes more stiff. And that's exactly what you would imagine happen for a tungsten or no gas, it goes to, to four. And then you cross over into the attractive regime over here where you have the super tungsten or no gas. And yes, you see that the system starts to stiffen because of those extra nodes in the wave function due to those correlations. It becomes stiffer and even goes up to around 4.5 up here, okay? But now something a little bit, uh, well, at least in hindsight, surprising happens, which is that the system starts to, to soften again and collapses into, uh, uh, into what are called cluster states. Um, they're over here, uh, cluster states where the, the gas just falls out of the trap. And the reason is because you have all these bound states in this attractive gas here, and the system basically um, uh, transitions into them and forms ga uh, these gases or balls of, of two or four or three or any sorts of combinations of kind of, you know, uh, molecular states. And because they have different polarizability, they fall out of the optical dipole trap. All right. So this system collapses, preventing one from looking at uh, uh, R less than four here. Now, this is sort of understood from a Monte Carlo calculation that, um, that takes into account the actual trap shape. Uh, where it actually crosses, it's going to be somewhere around A squared is equal to one plus or minus an order of magnitude. Where it crosses is not quite universal, it's due to microscopic physics, it's not accounted for. Um, but that's the kind of, you know, manifestation of, of this super Tonks gas that is observed in a weakly dipolar system. But this might trouble you a little bit, because I spent, you know, the first half of my talk telling you that, you know, the lieb linegar model, which, which ostensibly describes the system, is integrable, and integrable systems shouldn't collapse. So why, there should be an end there, uh, so why, why the collapse here, folks? Well, um, I can explain that in this slide here, okay? So what I'm plotting here, again, is that A squared parameter. 
where over on the left-hand side, it's strongly interacting, and on the right-hand side, it's not interacting for the attractive side, okay? So this is right after we've um, done the quench, gone through the CIR, and you enter, um, you adiabatically enter this super tungs gas uh, energy eigenstate, which is the gas-like state. It's the lowest energy gas-like state. Um, but immediately, uh, come, it's no longer the uh, ground state. That's what that toy model showed. Immediately, there are, in the thermodynamic limit, an infinite number of bound states. These are the cluster states below it. Now, as you know, this, when you're in this regime, you're still in the unitary regime, where basically this, this is so large that nothing else matters, and it's stable. But as you go out of this unitary regime where the, the interaction strength becomes finite and still negative and attractive, then the bound state energy starts to peak up and start to cross through the gas-like uh, states. Now, the, the lieb Linegar model being integrable, these states just pass through, there's no avoided crossing. The, the gas will just uh, stay on this, this uh, state and nothing will happen. And that's what we mean by no collapse. But this is not really what's going on in the system. What's going on in the system is that we have a trap. Uh, it's not perfectly a 1D confinement. It's not infinitely long. There's virtual transverse excitations. And those break integrability as, as really explored in this paper here. And so by breaking the integrability, there's a mixing, there's a matrix element between the gas-like eigenstates and the bound state eigenstates. And so with each one of these, you get a little bit of an avoided crossing. And and as you pass through here by changing the magnetic field, a little bit of um, probability amplitude goes into these bound states until eventually so much has gone into it that the system manifests as a collapse, okay, to the bound state and fall, falls out of your trap, okay? So that's what really happens. And that's, that explains uh, what Christoph Negro's group saw in this, this kind of downturn and softening. So, you know, I, I told you a lot about adding dipoles to the picture. So if we do that, you might just say, well, Ben, nothing interesting is gonna happen, right? You add the dipolar interaction, that breaks integrability too. We know that from the, the Newton's cradle experiment where we can, uh, when, we, well, uh, when we increase the dipolar strength, it, uh, the thermalization increases. Um, so we know it breaks integrability. So we should just expect that the DDI further destabilizes the super tungs gap, right? <laughs> right, everybody? Uh, so let's do the experiment. Let's see if that intuition holds, okay? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our dipolar 1D gas system and we're gonna uh, change the magnetic field um, through the uh, quench, through the CIR, into the super tungs regime with the dipole, dipole interaction set to some angle, you know, all right? And see what happens. All right, so now we've set it to 55 degrees. And if you recall, that gives us no dipolar interaction within the tube. And we plot the stiffness as a function of this A squared parameter. Again, this is strongly interacting, this is weakly interacting. And if you recall, the cesium data kind of came up and then went down right around this Monte Carlo uh, calculation, kind of somewhere halfway between here. What we see is something qualitatively uh, similar uh, in that we have a stiff gas, a uh, super tungs gas here, but it doesn't it exist um, beyond uh, kind of a weakening of the, the, the contact interaction. It comes down, becomes less stiff. We're able to actually see it below F, uh, R is equal to four. And that's an interesting thing I'll talk about a, uh, later on, but we see that it becomes less and less stiff until eventually we can't create the gas anymore in this state. It becomes unstable and presumably formed clusters. All right, so that's qualitatively sim similar to a non-dipolar cesium gas. Now let's rotate the magnetic field so that we're uh, in the attractive regime where theta is equal to zero. This is attractive DDI. And what we see is a shifting of this curve to higher, um, to, to larger contact interactions, okay? More strongly coupled. It's going unstable earlier in this x-axis, meaning that somehow the attraction between the particles due to um, dipolar interactions is counteracting the attraction due to con contact interactions and making it go uh, uh, unstable more readily, okay? It's somewhat intuitive. Uh, no one has ever predicted this, uh, this you know, order of magnitude or so shift, um, but that's what we find, okay? So now you, you might sit back and say, well, um, I would predict that if we go to now 90 degrees where it's repulsive, that we would see a similar order of magnitude shift of this instability point to, to lower uh, contact interactions, okay? 
That would be kind of the obvious prediction. Maybe it doesn't shift quite as much because as I said earlier, the repulsive DDI is half the strength of the attractive DDI just due to you know, the functional form of dipole interactions, right? So maybe it won't shift very much. So then you can imagine that we were quite surprised when we took this data, which looks nothing like that expectation. So this is what we found and whoa, it seems like the dipole-dipole interaction stabilizes the supertonus gas no matter where we set the contact interaction. So what we see is that it's, it's, it, we have strong correlations, it's a super tongs gas here, but instead of coming down or coming down somewhere where you might expect it, it stays flat and even increases before coming down to a four, uh, becoming less stiff around four, uh, near where the, the strength of the dipole interaction becomes roughly equal to the strength of the contact, the attractive contact interaction, but it doesn't collapse there. In fact, we can create gases all the way throughout here with a stiffness that's about four. So it never collapses. And that's something that is really amazing because this is not a very big shift here, okay? Now we can compare it to the only calculation we know about, which is for the ideal lieb linegar model, i.e. one with no trap and no dipolar interaction, which is beta onset solvable. And that's this uh, curve here. It doesn't get this right. It gets this qualitatively right but certainly not quantitatively, you know, obviously it doesn't predict a collapse either because it's an integrable model. The only thing that we can explain about this at this point is this point here, part here, the fact that this doesn't start at four like it does for, for cesium is because, might be because we use a narrow line Feshbach resonance rather than a broad uh, Feshbach resonance. And that physics was explained here, but that is only applicable down here. What happens over here, nobody knows. We can speculate though. Um, so, you know, you might say, well, you know, this is just an energy effect, energy barrier effects, you know, um, maybe that's what's going on here, but I don't know about here because the DDI contribution is small. It's about 10 times less than the energy density is here. Um, and in, when we take data, uh, stiffness data for the, the repulsive branch, you know, the one that's kind of under this before you hit the quench, you don't see any dependence on theta of that. It looks identical. And I can show you that data at the end. Um, it looks identical, um, which tells you two things. One, the DDI doesn't change everything. Uh, it only changes it in these really um, delicate states. And uh, the, the intertube dipolar interaction, which is non-negligible, um, doesn't seem to have uh, you know, anything but a common mode effect because on the re repulsive branch, um, you can change the angle and nothing changes. So perhaps the DDI induces corrections to the wave function um, that leads to bunching or anti-bunching. So here the anti-bunching is, is particularly um, impactful in that it, it stabilizes all the way. So that would be some very delicate many body correlations in the many body wave function that effectively kind of suppresses the effects of the other integrability breaking terms. And that's really the kind of the, the key mystery here, which is that Somehow, by adding a new integrability breaking term, i.e. The, the dipolar interaction, we take a system that we know is already not, not perfectly integrable and make it seem like it's integrable in the sense that it does the same thing as the beta onsatz calculation does for an integrable system. It never collapses qualitatively, maybe not quantitatively, okay? That's just a real mystery. And of course, all you brilliant theorists out there might uh, want to help us figure this out. Okay, but the really neat thing, consequence of this uh, discovery of dipolar stabilization of, the, of super tongs gases is that we can implement a topological pump. So we can complete the cycle of G1D as a function of magnetic field from zero plus infinity minus infinity all the way back to zero without the system ever collapsing. This was not possible in, in cesium. The, the, the gas fell out of the trap before you can uh, get too far uh, close to zero here. Okay, it broke the cycle, but we can do it. So um, to illustrate this, what we'll do is measure something different. We'll measure energy density, which you can get just by dropping the gas and summing up all the momentum. Um, and uh, we'll plot this uh, as a, in the y-axis as a function of pi squared divided by three times something that looks like Fermi energy. That just is natural from the beta onsatz calculations that gives you these nice uh, integers here. Um, and on the x-axis, we'll plot uh, dimensionless gamma, where now, the limit of G1D goes to infinity is on the right-hand side, whereas the non-interacting is on the left-hand side, okay? 
All right, so let's start here on the repulsive branch. So that is somewhere over here. And what we see is a nice correspondence between the theory and uh, for the repulsive ground state and the day that we take for the energy. It goes up to one of these Fermi, normalized Fermi energies. Now we do the quench. We go through uh, this holonomic point and we go up on the upper branch and that's these blue squares here. And again, we see nice correspondence to what you would expect from the integrable model that doesn't include the trap or the DDI. And we can keep doing this, let's keep going. We can go to the second CIR and do this again and do it again. And so now we see two repulsive branches and two attractive branches as we screw the system all the way up, just like the, uh, just like the Archimedes screw, okay? But of course, this is an energy eigenstate space not in real space, okay? But you see this kind of, it's kind of cute, this kind of screwing like, like curve here. But this is the, holo, the quantum holonomy, the manifestation of it is these arrays of eigen, energy eigenstates that just get pumped up higher and higher and higher in energy and seem strangely, and we don't exactly know why this should be pretty darn close to the integrable prediction. What are these things here? Like I circled in the Newton's cradle, those intermediate states, that live long, long time, um, these states here can be considered pre-thermal states. Um, they're excited, obviously, um, and we'll show in a moment that they live quite long, um, and they're strongly correlated. The wave functions that I plotted earlier, these have many, many nodes in those wave functions. These are very strongly correlated systems up here. Okay, so let's measure um, the stiffness and energy density as a function of time to understand these pre-thermal states a little bit better. Well, we've done this for many of those states that I showed you in that, in that uh, plot, but let's just focus on one because the other ones look very similar. We'll just focus on this particular one that's kind of that intermediate coupling here, okay? Um, so we'll measure the stiffness as a function of, of hold time in that state. So each one of these points is a measurement of the ratio of oscillation frequencies, and we repeat it again with different delay times, all right? And what we see is that the stiffness is greater than four, indicating a strongly correlated gas for 50, 60 seconds or so, okay? Let's say 40, 50 seconds, uh, milliseconds, okay? And you can ask, is that long? Well, it's certainly longer than the intrinsic uh, 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 collective oscillation period of the system, which is about 10 milliseconds. And so it doesn't have a huge Q, but it has a Q that's large enough to show that this is a, a collective mode here, okay? Um, and then at the same time, we can measure the energy density through time of flight measurements. And most importantly, what we see here is that A, it corresponds to the prediction from the beta ansatz um, uh, calculation for an integrable model, but, but it doesn't heat. It doesn't increase in time. There's no exponential heating or whatever. So what that tells us is that what, what, what's going on here is that you're thermalizing, but you're not heating. That is, there is an increase in entropy rather than in energy. So that implies that what's going on is that at t equals zero, you have some special state that is not a generic thermal state or a cluster state, um, but that as time goes on, you kind of ergodically uh, drift into those, you kind of diffuse into those states, okay? But what the, the point is that it highlights that this is a very um, unique and atypical state, whereas these states over here are the generic states. That's what it goes to. So the conclusion from this measurement about these pre-thermal states is that they seem to be atypical, strongly correlated excited states that persist for a long time, all right? So what does that mean? Well, it means that they're scar-like, okay? That these strongly correlated pre-thermal states are scar-like. So let me explain you know, one definition of scar, uh, which is that uh, quantum many body scars are delicate, carefully prepared, atypical, strongly interacting states. And uh, importantly, they avoid thermalization, even though the rest of the states around there are, are you know, are chaotic and, and, non, and non, because it's a non-integrable system. These are special states. The name derives from the uh, work done in the 80s that recognized that single particle wave functions in chaotic systems like a billiard, like an elliptical billiard I was showing you earlier, um, there, uh, there are a few special wave functions that have probability density along classical trajectories that uh, loop back onto themselves that are what are called unstable periodic trajectories. If you move them just a little bit, they, they start to become chaotic, but these perfect trajectories per persist for a long time. These are many body versions of those. 
And they were discovered, the first instance experimentally was discovered just a few years ago in a one-dimensional lattice of Rydberg atoms, where an, if an antiferromagnetic pattern of the Rydberg lattice is imprinted, it'll oscillate in that pattern for several cycles, just like our system oscillates um, for several cycles as well. So what, we, what these states in the middle here are, um, are examples of scar-like states in a continuum, not in a lattice system, created by a 1D dipolar gas. Now we shade this intermediate coupling regime because these are out of bounds because it's a unitary regime and because it's unitary, the model, regardless of any perturbations from the dipolar or the trap, um, render the system integrable. Okay, so that kind of violates this, this part of the, the clause here. And these are non-interacting, so that kind of violates the, this part of the clause here. This is just an excited Bose gas. So, but these kind of form a hierarchy in the, eigen, in the many body energy eigenstate uh, spectrum of things that are like scars. They're really pre-thermal states because they don't exist forever. You know, experimentally, you know, these things will eventually thermalize um, or equilibrate, but these are akin to those and they exist here and here and all the way up um, the, the, the eigenspectrum. Okay, so now uh, let me conclude and point to future directions. So in this talk, uh, I presented work from two papers from my group. The first one presented a dipolar um, or magnetic quantum Newton's cradle, which um, shows that you can make thermal, uh, pre-thermal states in it. And then uh, what we didn't show, but you can read in this paper, is how by controlling the dipole interaction, we control the thermalization rate therein. Um, but we use the same kind of system, not kicking it in the same way, but gently um, changing a, a parameter in a Hamiltonian like a topological pump to bring it into uh, you know, various uh, uh, pre-thermal states that are strongly correlated and has some relation or akin to scar states, many body scar states. So the main conclusion is that the dipolar stabilization of, of the supertonics gas was a, came as a complete surprise. I don't see, I, I've never seen that in any uh, prior literature. And it's really, you know, this nice example of an experiment that really um, discovered something new. You know, this was not a demonstration of known physics. And so, you know, yay for experimentalists. Um, and this allows us to realize these quantum holonomies in this novel type of quantum pumping and energy space. So future directions. Um, well, we, you know, as I alluded to earlier, you know, why is it that you add an integrability breaking perturbation and the system kind of looks integrable again. And, you know, it, you can put the data on top of something uh, from, from an integrable model. We don't really know, but some people have speculated, Vita Kamani, who's at Stanford and, and others, has speculated that scars or at least some subclass of stars often exist near integrable systems. Okay. Um, so to kind of inform those discussions, we can do more experiments to characterize them. We can measure their lifetime. Or, and we can measure their rapidity, which is a fancy way of saying their quasi-particle momentum spectrum. And we know how to do that now because, again, David Weiss showed us how to do that in a recent work with Tom with uh, Tung Shiro gases, and we're now doing that at uh, kind of arbitrary uh, gammas in, in our system, and uh, that will hopefully enable us to understand these systems better. And what we hope to see and understand is a breakdown of a leading theory for describing these systems which is called generalized hydrodynamics, uh, where the dipolar per uh, perturbation can kind of break this down in an interesting way and we can see how that happens. Um, so some people who have been thinking about this are Friedman, Gopal, Christian, and Vassur, and many others, I'm sure some in the audience. And uh, these folks here are looking at how this uh, happens in our system specifically, actually. So, and last, you know, this is just the beginning for this kind of new kind of system. You know, we've had this new, interesting, excited quantum state of matter that we can play with. We can repeat the system with fermions or mixtures of spin states or Bose and fermions. And um, there's a lot of interesting uh, quirks of the data that we see that we don't uh, understand yet that are kind of tangential to this story, but interesting in their own right, like these data points down here that were not observed in the cesium system. We can make stable, um, um, uh, you know, low stiffness uh, gases that maybe, according to these uh, papers here, are, are gas-like cluster states, okay? And so there's a lot of little bits and pieces of our data that uh, beg to be understood, okay? All right, so with that, I'll thank you for your patience and show
a picture of my group that is now outdated, but pre-COVID picture. Um, again, a point to all the, the wonderful students who carried forth this experiment and our theory collaborators. And then just uh, show a shameless plug for some other results in, in my laboratory. We have three experiments, not just the dysprosium experiment. And uh, a really neat new result that just appeared on the archive is the creation of an optical lattice with sound using confocal cavity QED. By which I mean, we can create an optical lattice that has phonon modes, actual vibrations. And what you see here in this orange is a real super solid in the sense that it, it's a, it has superfluidity and spatial structure, plus it has vibrational modes, phonon modes, a full Goldstone spectrum. So that's really exciting and opening up a lot of new avenues for exploration. One other thing that we're doing with this system is to create quantum optical neural networks. And a theory paper from our group is appearing any day now on, on, at, on PRX, so you can, you can see that. And last, we have this new type of microscope called the scram scope, where we can use a BEC to image the magnetic fields from electrons through materials. We recently reported, well, recently now a year ago, uh, reported uh, doing this with an iron superconductor and imaging electron pneumatic transport as a function of temperature. So that's all I have to say, and thank you all. Thank you very much, Ben. We have uh, a number of questions for you here. Um, I'm going to cover a couple of them. Okay. Um, and, uh, and then for those with uh, additional questions that don't get covered, uh, please feel free to uh, come to the, uh, the after discussion with Ben to, uh, to ask there. Okay, so um, Henry Everett asks, uh, could you say something more about the evolution of entropy in these star scar states? Does entropy stay constant while thermalization is delayed? Um, well, if it's in an experimental system where you know eventually thermalized entropy is increasing because it's starting to take on more and more uh, character of nearby thermal states, and so you know when we see that the energy doesn't change but the stiffness goes down into something that looks like a, a thermal state, the only thing that can be changing is really, or increasing is really the entropy. Thank you. Okay, um, Wolfgang Ketterly asks, uh, remind me, what are the two knobs for skew screwing the system to higher, higher energy? One is- Well, the there's only- field. Yeah. Yeah, thanks Wolfgang. Um, there's only one knob and that's the magnetic field. So all we're doing is going through a Feshbach resonance or a confinement induced resonance. So there's only one knob. Um, thank you. All right. Um, so uh, as an alternative way to measure the lifetime, could you go partway through the pumping cycle and then wait some amount of time and then go the rest of the way through the pumping cycle and see to what extent it remembers where it was? Yes, that's a really interesting thing to do. And in fact, in our paper, we did something similar to that. When we, when we looked at the uh, um, energy density and stiffness of as a function of time of uh, pre-thermal states higher up on that rung. Um, there, it turns out, and you can see this from the beta ansatz equations, their stiffness is, is very close to four. So you can't really distinguish whether you have something different than the thermal state, but what you can do is go up there and then go back down uh, to one that is different than four and then see whether it's still different than four, depending on the whole time. And you can, and you can make that work, okay? And then you can look at the lifetime of that and it has similar lifetime. That data is in the paper and I have it in other slides. Um, but that's similar in spirit to what you're suggesting, but you're suggesting something slightly different. And, and that's among the things that we intend to do to get at these lifetimes. Thank you. Uh, so we have two more quick questions here. One is a, a follow-up from Wolfgang. Uh, okay. With one knob, you can only go back and forth. Uh, uh -huh. How do you go up in energy? Just by going forwards okay if you go in one direction it just screws in one direction as well because it has this kind of chiral like behavior and so you can go forwards by increasing the magnetic field you can go backwards by decreasing but re in relation to the i think the first question that was asked if you go backwards too much beyond the, the the ground state then the system will collapse and that kind of shows you that there's a difference between going forwards and backwards I, could I alternatively think of it as saying that effectively G1D is a periodic parameter? So 
You oh, it definitely is. Positive yeah. zero it, to infinity to minus infinity to zero, and that's a loop. Exactly, that is the loop, and it actually the orientation of that loop matters. Okay. That's why it's topological. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone named Norm Yao asks. Uh, I don't know who that is. That, yeah, neither do I. Uh, it seems that scar states and lattice models are oftentimes associated with some constraint on the Hilbert space. Uh -huh. uh, for example, the Rydberg blockade uh, in the Harvard experiment you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a similar intuition for how DDI causes the appearance of scar-like states in your system? That's a good question. I mean, we don't have the obvious constraint like with the Rydberg blockade. Um, you know, the, the repulsive dipolar interaction has some length scale associated with it. So maybe that comes into play in a similar fashion. But of course, there's no theory about that right now. So I, I don't really know exactly how that works. There's only some hunches. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Shimon Kolkowitz asks, uh, if your college band wasn't called the Quantum Newton's Cradle, uh, was it perhaps called uh, holonomic many body scars or the beta ansatz solution? Wow, that would be some some great foreshadowing. Um, uh, no, it wasn't. It was a very silly name that uh, I refuse to tell anybody. <laughs> it was a it was a good try though, right? Okay, so on on that note, um, let me point out that uh, let me take the screen sharing away from you actually for a moment. Okay. Um, so can you unshare? I will unshare now. Yes. All yeah. right. Um, so let me just uh, remind you of next week's talk. Oh, I was not organized enough here. Here we go. Um, so there are two exciting talks next week. The first is in our sister series, the Quantum Science Seminar, and Scott Aronson will be speaking on Thursday. Uh, and uh, in the Vamos talk next week, Christian Gross will be uh, speaking Friday at the same time. Um, so with, uh, with that, uh, let's thank Ben again for a really wonderful talk. Okay. Thanks everybody, thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. Uh, and let me remind you all that there will be a post-seminar discussion at the link in the chat. So uh, if you wanna interact with Ben a little bit more, please, uh, feel welcome to join us there. Okay, Except so I should Norm. switch over to that now? Mm -hmm. Norm's not invited to join.